You guys and girls really loved last year's video on slower than light interstellar travel, so we're going to look at the topic again. This time we'll be looking at a selection of realistic interstellar craft that cover a good cross section of the many designs out there. And no, there's no ISV Venture Star, that one already got a whole video to itself. Travelling between stars is a bit of a challenge. The mind-boggling distance to cover means that only the most high-performance engine technologies are viable, and the travel times can be measured in years, decades or centuries. Setting up a craft to carry people for that long makes everything so much more difficult, so it makes sense to start out with a probe, just like the things we already send out into the solar system. This is the basis of Project Daedalus, created by the British Interplanetary Society. Stepping a bit outside their jurisdiction there though, weren't they? I'm including Daedalus here because it's one of the earliest studies done into designing an interstellar ship. And because look at the thing, it's gigantic! Atop its two stages of enormous rocket was a 500 ton scientific payload destined for Barnard Star, some 5.9 light years away. Both stages used inertial confinement fusion engines of different sizes, carrying a combined total of 50,000 tons of deuterium and helium-3 for propellant. To put that in easily understandable human terms, that's 1.6 billion slices of American cheese. Hit the like button if we should start basing all measurements on cheese. That's actually so much helium-3 that the study proposes spending two decades skimming it off Jupiter's atmosphere using robot factories hanging from hot air balloons. How much more interesting is that as a concept versus yet another boring mining op on the moon? The first of these gigantic stages does this for over two years before passing the baton to the second stage, which runs for another 1.8 years, up to a final velocity of 12% of light speed. If you watched the previous Interstellar video, you know that when you start getting up to good fractions of light speed like that, the emptiness of space starts to feel not quite so empty. To protect against the occasional impact from the interstellar medium, the name for what's out there between stars, Daedalus carries a 50 ton disc of beryllium to hide behind. And the result of this immense craft, the 20 years of mining Jupiter, the 50 years of travel time, a fly-through of the Barnard star system. Yep, Daedalus doesn't even stop when it gets where it's going. To maximise this brief, tiny window of opportunity, it carries 18 sub-probes that do their own flybys of priority targets in the star system. Their data is sent back to the mothership, which relays it back home. That is a really huge craft for just a flyby though. Most of its mass comes from propellant, which takes years to collect, but there is a better way, the laser sail. These are just like solar sails, but are pushed by a huge laser beam which doesn't drop off over distance anywhere near as much as sunlight does. This next design is actually a whole family of laser sail craft from Robert L. Forward's Roche World series. Now, this may be fiction, but the man was a physicist, and the craft in these books reflect that. The starting points for all of them are the lasers around Mercury, firing their beams at a 1000 km diameter Fresnel lens sitting in the outer solar system. This cyclopean lens can focus Focus the beam all the way out to 40 light years, a capability that's needed for a good trick we'll get to in a sec. For now, the beam is just used for a little one ton flyby sail probe, pushing on it for three years to send it on a 40 year cruise to and through the Alpha Centauri star system. Where this tech gets interesting is the later crewed missions that actually want to come to a stop within the star system. These later missions also use their own laser sails, but how do you use those to slow down when the laser stays all the way back home? The answer is staging. The first sail stage detaches and becomes a mirror, reflecting the laser beam backwards at the second stage sail, slowing it down to a stop. This concept can actually go a step further. With a third stage, you can do the same reflected backwards trick off the second stage, accelerating the third stage back towards the laser, and all the way back home. Just absolutely genius, though obviously not without its challenges. The third design is more of a concept in general than any one specific design, and it's another useful way to avoid bringing metric sh** tons of propellant with you. This is the Bussard Ramjet, invented by Robert Bussard in 1960. Yep, those red things on the front of Star Trek warp cells are based off a real thing. 
These work just like the air-breathing jet engine they take their name from, but instead of intaking atmosphere, compressing and heating it to get a jet plume and thrust out the back, Bussard ramjets intake the interstellar medium. They turn that hazardous element of relativistic travel into a key feature, slurping up all that free hydrogen with an enormous electromagnetic funnel. The hydrogen gets squeezed down until it fuses, blasting out the back with hopefully enough thrust to overcome the drag created from hitting and redirecting it in the first place. This type of craft is really alluring because it basically has unlimited propellant, just scooping it up as it flies through space. Ideally, a Bussard ramjet could do constant acceleration for any length of time, and decelerating down to a different star is also made easier by the funnel's drag, like a parachute. Sounds perfect, right? Well, there's a lot of flaws. Strike one, the amount of hydrogen actually out there to use in our neighbourhood is a lot lower than first thought. Strike 2, the funnel has to be moving pretty quick before it can actually work. Strike 3, the craft cannot go faster than the exhaust velocity of its engine because of drag. They have a top speed! You're out of here! What? There's also a bunch of technical challenges to overcome, like getting this type of fusion to work, which is harder than the type used on the Daedalus from earlier. But ultimately, Bussard ramjets do work, which is why I mention them. It just seems like the downsides might outweigh the benefits. At least they led to the creation of mag sails and similar things, but those will be the subject of a future video. So, you know when I said there'd be no Venture Star? Oh, I lied. Well, sort of. The Valkyrie here, designed by Charles Pellegrino and Jim Powell, is actually its ancestor, and you can see the similarities in the design. They both have antimatter engines pulling on a tensile structure with a debris shield at the front. But there's also many differences, like the Valkyrie being a whopping 10 kilometers long, and the engine unit being a very unusual looking lacy magnetic nozzle. There's also two of them, one at each end. This means that when decelerating, the backwards engines fire, instead of the entire craft flipping around and exposing the huge length of itself to incoming particles moving at a brisk 92% the speed of light. The Valkyrie's radiators are also entirely different, dumping waste heat into magnetically controlled droplets that get flung out ahead of the ship, where they pull double duty as a particle shield, at least while the craft is accelerating. This is an interesting design to me for two reasons. Firstly, it's unusual looks. The long, stringy nature of it is just so different to the usual idea of a spacecraft, even an interstellar one. Secondly, the way this design evolves into what we see in Avatar. I really wonder how much was changed just to seem more believable, because even the ISV design is way out there for what the general audience may expect a spacecraft to look like. The last design I want to talk about are the Light Huggers from Alistair Reynolds' Revelation Space Series, which are realistic but in a different way to everything else we've talked about. The technicalities behind how they function are way off the deep end, like they have high acceleration torch drives with infinite propellant. They border on magic, but the ships still fly around within the laws of physics like everything else from earlier, they're just on the extreme end of it. And this is where all the interesting bits come into it, like their hull shape. They're all pointy and sharp and even seem aerodynamic because when your ship can start pushing the 99% of light speed, the interstellar medium becomes a lot more of an obstacle. This is also why the ships have an outer layer of sacrificial compacted cometary ice, which by itself just says so much about how these vessels operate. The ridiculous relativistic velocities also really brings into play all the weird things we covered in last year's Slower Than Light craft video, like the crazy external view and heavy time dilation. The first one is more of a footnote, but the second becomes part of the overall vibes and story the books tell, with big differences in ship side and planet side time. So that's five interstellar vehicles that all use realistic physics in their designs, but all in different ways that demonstrate the immense challenges associated with such extreme journeys and the variety of solutions that are available. You can support Space Dock by joining our Patreon, where you can get our frigate, fighter and carrier design reference books, as well as one week early access to upcoming videos. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching. 